think it probably still is the largest police search operation in history. So he basically took her off the street and uh, yeah, well, she just disappeared off the face of the earth, basically. You know, we, well, I can tell you, we, we tried our hardest. I mean, I've never worked in an environment as it was in Wales, in a small little quiet country town. You know, I mean, we turned that place upside down. Neil, how are you, Hello. sir? I'm very good. I'm very good. How are you? Yes, excellent, mate. I really appreciate you coming to chat. Do you know what? I mean, I genuinely appreciate you asking me to come on. I don't know whether my story and stuff will be what people will want to hear, but, you know, we'll give it a spin and see what comes. Yeah, I I have a kind of, you know, my approach to podcasts, mate, is I, I just want to chat to the people that, I'd never get a chat, you know, when am I going to yeah, yeah. meet someone that knows as much about dog handling and and the police and, and how it all works? You yeah, know, that's um, good. That's good. Everybody and, has uh, their own life experiences, don't they, at the end of the day? So Yeah. I mean, you get to hear that the celebrities are always on podcasts, aren't they? And they're always yeah. on telly. So <laughs> it's... it's. Uh, I haven't got it's... a face for telly, though, unfortunately. I've got a face for radio. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just like, I, I think there's so many valuable stories that um, shouldn't be forgotten. Yeah. They tend to be from quite humble people like yourself that, that are like, well, do you want to hear my story? It's like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I must admit it was a, uh, I listened to your podcast for a long time. Um, I do enjoy them a lot. I mean, I've got, I spend a lot of time driving because I drive 83 miles to work when I go to work. So I have a lot of time on my hands. So podcasts have become um, my new thing to listen to, and I started listening to you. And you do some you do some great content, I have to say. Well, so thank I'm you. I'm quite surprised that you wanted to speak to me. Put it that way. Yeah, no. Uh, um, all, uh, obviously, big respect to our police force and and for the job that you guys do. Yeah. Um, and let's be honest, people love animals in this country, don't they? Or the the majority i should say probably not yeah, no, absolutely i think um the country as a whole is very pro animals um i've obviously i've got some experience doing search i had search dogs as well as um gp dogs the biting dogs or the sort of patrol dogs um dogs can be uh dogs are a sort of conversation starter i think if that makes sense i used to work yeah. at Heathrow doing some stuff and people they wouldn't routinely come up and talk to a police officer unless they needed help or they wanted something if that makes sense um or they wanted to know something sorry but then with the dog it's a it's a it's an icebreaker definitely does that become a bit of an issue because obviously the dogs in your role are they're professionals as well they're they're doing a job and um do people uh, come up to, trying um I mean, if, if I was doing work, if I was on a search at Heathrow doing odds and sods with my search dog, I wouldn't want people bothering the dog. If we were doing, uh, we used to do foot patrols and stuff. So if you're doing a patrol around the airport as a, some sort of high visibility reassurance policing, then as long as the dog wasn't engaged in his role, I wouldn't have a massive issue. You know, kids want to come up and talk to the dog, just adults in general. So I've, as long as people ask, Sometimes I would get, uh, what's the best word to say? Sometimes I might get a bit grumpy if someone starts sort of bothering the dog while he's working. But at the end of the day, that too comes with the role, if that makes sense. You can't really get bent out of shape if someone just wants to talk to the dog. You just sort of have to try to be diplomatic and say, you know, look, give us 10 minutes. Let me finish what I'm doing. And if you, I'll come back. And if you're still here, you can tickle the dog and say hello. Yes. Is it always that thing where if the dog's got its, you know, harness on or whatever, it's it's in work mode and it the um, dog understands that? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, like the patrol dogs, you put a harness on, the dog knows they're going tracking. So tracking is, uh, let's have a look. So tracking is someone steals a car, dumps it somewhere, runs off, walks off. So you can turn up as long as people haven't been around the car. 
then the dog should latch on to the most recent human scent. So you can work the dog around the car uh, and the dog will go and in theory and in practice, they'll follow every footstep and take you to a point where the track finishes, be it we, but we have a lot of success. Uh, they'll take you to a front door, literally right to the front door. Then you knock on the door and there's a bloke, you know, sweating profusely, looking shifty. Uh, sometimes you get to a point where uh, intelligence later tells you that a car picked them up or anything like that. So, yeah, when you put that harness on, that is a, a key point or a trigger. And the dog sort of sits there and goes, all right, OK, we're doing that now, if that makes sense. Yeah, got you. Do you have any... Um knowledge of the Raumo incident no I do not well I know uh I know a I know of a handler I mean he's dead now bless him Gav he went up there to do part of that as one of the firearm support dogs from the Met um but no from Raul only what was on the news if that makes it I, I wasn't when was it I can't remember when it was gosh it was a good five or six years ago now wasn't it I think it might even be more than that um no but I mean I think when major incidents like that occur then there's a thing in the police called mutual aid where one force can ring a central place and say look we need some help like the Met did it for the Olympics there's police officers and dogs from all around the UK come down to London to help with the Olympics so that incident in itself was a uh, was a firearms operation wasn't it so they need certain people with certain skills and certain dogs with certain skills. So yeah, the Met did send a couple, but um, no, it's not some, me personally, the only major thing I dealt with was the April Jones search when the little girl went missing in Wales. Oh, so what was I the spent, outcome of that? I can't, I can't remember. Oh no, so um, she was taken off the street by the suspect and sadly, and it's one of my major regrets in my career, we never found her. But ne I spent- ne ne Never ever, no. no no, um, when so we went looking for her. I spent uh, probably eight or nine weeks solid from sort of the start of October uh, in Wales. I basically, my missus was kind enough to sort of say, "Look, you need to go." So go. So me and the dog and a load of others of my colleagues. Um, so we went. We went and we were part of. Some of them are retired, some of them aren't. And there was officers from literally all over the UK. And we did, you know, we did our best at the end of the day, 100%. Because it was a big, or it was a, certainly something that came up in the Madeleine McCann case, wasn't it? That they had the cadaver dogs. Yeah. And I remember hearing something in a documentary that statistically, it's like these dogs are never wrong. Yep. You know? I mean, so dogs have... 220 million olfactory glands so in your you as a human you've got 5 million so your uh, your scent pattern in front of your face is about the size of a handkerchief that's where your that's what you'll be able to smell if that makes sense um, whereas dogs is about the size of a bath towel and technically if you can narrow down uh, a unique substance in something uh, then you can teach a dog to find it. At the end of the day, it's taught through repetition and classical conditioning and all that jazz. But if the dog sniffs it and it receives its toy, the dog learns because they are clever. They're very, very clever. They learn. If I find that, I get to play with my ball. And that's, I mean, that's the absolute bare bones of it, but it is purely that simple. You teach them a target odour and then you teach them to search, then you take them out into all sorts of different environments. They search, they find, and that they, that's it in its sort of purest form. Mm. Yeah, they're just doing their thing, aren't they? There's yeah. no pot, and they no love pot. it. They get, you know, I mean, I get paid wages, they get paid with a tennis ball. <laughs> and it is uh, for search dogs, you know, they're high drive, you know, top grade spaniels, cockers, labs, and the like. And it is there. It is their function in life. That's what there's millions of years of evolution for dogs to hunt. And all you're trying to do is harness uh, behaviours and drives that are already in the dog. That's basically in the wild. If they don't hunt, they don't eat. In my world, if they don't hunt, they don't get to play with a tennis ball. Yeah. 
it's like giving you a superpower isn't it oh for them they are them they're mega they're, i mean i've seen i've seen dogs in the past that have done some things where you sort of look at it and go how on earth have you pulled that out but to them it's probably very simple because of the the keenness of their nose they they find finding things quite easy if that makes sense so the, what it the scent picture so stuff if you discard something so you've stolen a car and you've run off if you discard the car key it obviously smells it smells one of your scent you're sweating and concerned about um the fact that the feds are chasing you if that makes sense so you dump it you can try and be as smart as you like but for me as a human being it doesn't smell but for the dog it could you know smell like a grizzly bear is hiding in a cupboard mm. because it's that their their keenness and their sense of smell is phenomenal yeah got you blimey and so let's peel back to the beginning then neil yeah. when when you joined the force yeah did you have the intent were you a doggy sort of person or, or did this so i blue? i joined uh 1997 so i was one month before my 21st birthday literally um i used to drive my parents nuts because i've always loved working dogs so i was very lucky i grew up in lincolnshire we had a ref station nearby that had a they used to do when they were allowed they were, used to do uh, air shows and stuff and there'd always be the ref police dog display or the demonstration uh, and i would always my parents were very good to me they would take me are you, uh, Milden Halls in Norfolk, they, they used to do a phenomenal air show, the American base, there was a, again. So I used to, um, yeah, I always wanted to work with dogs. Um, I had it in my mind, I was going to join uh, the military just for some sort of life experience. I applied to one police force um, originally, and they basically said, yeah, you know, we'd love to take you, but you need to sort of disappear and get a little bit of life experience because I think I was only 18 or something at the time. So um, both my parents are quite clever. My mum was a teacher and my dad was a, a, a dentist and they're both clever, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah. um, so they sort of tried to steer me towards university. So... I did the university thing. I studied criminology and law for a little while, but it wasn't really for me. So um, after two years, I sort of pulled the pin on that, uh, applied to the to the Met, and they they accepted me. But I had to wait a good chunk of time. I think when I got the letter saying, "Well done, you're going to come and join," um, I think it was nigh on eighteen months or whatever. I was basically climbing the walls because I wanted to go, if that makes sense. And then, you know, Hendon's was at that time residential, 18 weeks, I think, an exam every week, you know, pass, fail. Um, and then I went out uh, April 1998 and I got posted to the East End of London, which was for a boy from the country, was a bit, was a bit of a culture shock, put it that way. Yeah, I bet. And yeah, at what good. point are you? What point are you allowed to put in for the dog section? Then is it that? A so you you can join the police, which is standard. And if you want to, it's called specialising. I think so. You have you have to be a confirmed officer. So you join, you do your training, you go out, you do what's called a street duties course, where you get puppy walked or mentored by a senior. PC who basically knows what they're doing so that you're not going to cause like carnage on the streets. You do that for 10 weeks. Then you, I was fortunate enough. I got posted onto a, a response team in uh, Plasto in the East end of London. Um, I was the person on the relief with the least amount of service for seven or eight months. So you get to do all the, the foundation learning of your role if that makes sense so you know shoplifters come out that's a job for the person that's sort of new if that makes sense and you're expected to you know volunteer they don't want to be chasing you if that makes sense so you know that's the sort of unwritten rule you know and you have to basically uh, eyes open ears open mouth shut uh, mm. and learn and 
uh, make the tea. But after those two years, you get your certificate that says you're confirmed in your rank, if that makes sense. And then after that, you're in a position where you can, if you choose to, apply to go and do uh, the myriad of different options mm. for CID, dog section, these days firearms, uh, what else? You can be an observer in the helicopter, you can drive boats, TSG, uh, the mounted branch. You know, I mean, the Met's, the Met's phenomenal for career opportunities. Mm. You know, in you've got people that protect the Queen, you've got people that protect the Prime Minister, you know, the DPG, you can work at the airport. Your options are uh, almost limitless, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's like the sort of golden uh, golden draft, isn't it? Yeah, really? absolutely. And, you know, I've known people in my time that have, uh, after three or four years of being a police officer, they've spent the next 25 specialising from different things. So you get some uh, phenomenally skilled people, if that makes sense. Mm. So, you know, that's, yeah, it's good. I mean, I was 97. I, I applied to be a dog under in 2003 or 2003 or 2004. So you have to do an application. You have to meet some uh, criteria, if that makes sense. Um, then if you get through what's called the paper sift, so someone reads you, you have to uh, do scenarios and examples on your form. And if somebody independent reads it, they score it. And then if you get through that, you go and do an interview, which is at that time was... I think an inspector, uh, a member of the police staff and possibly someone else, I can't remember. They sort of put you through your paces for an hour. Then if you get through that, you then get invited to go down to the dog training school where you do uh, what's called a suitability course where they assess you for a week on your affinity to work with dogs. And they obviously test you. They'll give you a dog to look after. There's kennel management, kennel husbandry, cleaning, walking, grooming. They give you assessments to do. Like I was a search handler first. So I was a, I, I was a bomb dog handler first. So you have to, that discipline requires the dog to be worked in a certain way. So they give you an input on that and then see if you can take on board instruction, see whether you can search a building. Um, uh, they'll take you for a, they take you for a, well, they used to it used to be a run, but they take you for a sort of meander around the country and they'll give you some obstacles to, there'll be four or five of you on the course. So they'll take you to uh, a style in the middle of a field and they'll basically say, you know, get these dogs over that style, but you don't, because it's not your dog, they give you a pool dog to look after. So you don't just sort of trot up, trot up to the style and fling the dog over. You know, there's a way to lift dogs. You have to pass them over. You have to look at, um, do the dogs fight the whole sort of shaboodle and they're constantly watching you it's more of a teamwork exercise if that makes sense mm. so if you are um, your bossy they sort of make a note of that you know it's not not psychometric testing but it's not you know it's somebody's opinion of you if you're an eye roller when someone suggests something and you sort of roll your eyes they obviously well trained instructors pick up on that sort of jazz so you know and then if you pass that they tell you to sort of disappear. Sorry about that, folks. No, you're all good. Um, then, uh, what was I saying? So suitability, you then get sort of told to disappear. Um, then, like, I was early term, so early shift, working out in uh, Tottenham, and I got a phone call saying, can you come down the dog school uh, next week to collect your dog, which came as a sort of a, a sort of bolt out of blue because I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> excuse me so then that was me you went down you get allocated a dog um and then i had to sort of carry on as a normal police officer but you obviously have um the the job's dog to look after so you have to walk it do all the stuff that then then you get um you go on puppy day so you get a couple of days a month where they take you and the dog and then they start teaching you stuff or they start looking does the dog come back to him when he calls it does the dog sort of you know for me as a search dog handler at the time 
is the dog interested in a tennis ball, i.e. the dog's wages? Uh, and then they'll give they'll start giving the dog things to do. Uh, the puppy days, because I used to do them um, as, as an instructor at the dog school, but that's 15 years down the line. Um, it's more important to sort of train the dog while it's young. Um, the handler per se can be trained or polished and have the rough edges sort of rubbed off while they're on a basic course, if that makes sense. So in the, on the puppy days, you're sort of teaching the dog different things. And for search, it is the whole, I search, I find. Basically, they'll put tennis balls out. Will the dog go off? Can you read the dog when it goes into the scent picture of the ball? Will it go to source? Because they're not just rewarded for... Um, uh, so scent pictures, obviously, if you put something out, scent picture, the, it sort of uh, filters out, right? No one knows how it works, but you put something in the corner of a room and you might look at it and think, yeah, that's a really good hide for a young dog. And then the dog finds it difficult. So you don't know how the training aid or whatever it is, how the scent sort of moves from where it is. So you have to look at, can, can you read the dog? I.e., right, the dog might turn, it might turn its head really quickly because that's, it's got a, it's got a whiff of something that it's used to, i.e., or it's something that is uh, part of its repertoire and its brain. So if it does its head turn, that's the handler's job to then keep the trap shut, leave the dog be to work. Uh, but you, oh, you, you learn that that comes with time and experience. Mm. It's reminding me a bit of when you get issued your weapon in the Marines. And it's obviously it's your big day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you find, no, absolutely. You if finally, you're not, get, you finally yeah, get the I mean, tool for the job. Yeah, absolutely. You, you're a, you're a next bootneck, and I'm sure the day when they give you your rifle at Limston, you're like, wow, this is it now. We're, we're on here. You know, for a dog person, uh, you know, I was literally, I couldn't sleep the night before I got my first dog because it is. I've waited. When did I join? 2005. So what's that? 1977. 87, 97. 28 sorry i'm not very good at maths um i was 28 and i'd waited from i probably dragged my parents around the uk from when i was five mm. so 23 years in the making i suppose um and you know my first dog caused me the occasional headache or two because he was a belligerent so and so um, but he was a good search dog if that makes sense so there that's the sort of animal that when they cause you problems or they cause you some strokey beard moments or scratchy head moments, they're worth, it's the peaks and troughs of being a dog handler. Mm. Is it like in the Marines, you get like the lad next to you gets his weapon and he's got a brand new SAA he's straight from the factory. It's still <laughs> covered in like the grease and stuff. Yeah. You get handed something that's clearly been used okay. by a, a load of, a load of recruits and they yeah. used a wire brush to clean it yeah. so it's and all they basically say clean that and make it work yeah and um i was i was very lucky i mean so in my bit you can probably conceivably get dogs from two maybe three ways one my my place they we breed dogs um i used to do that until about a year ago so the, the police have a breeding program. They have very strong working stock animals. And the goal is to breed uh, a police dog. Like Springer, you know, you, you have to breed Springer Spaniels, Cockers, Labs for search. Uh, you have to breed German Shepherds for patrol work. Some people breed Malinois, you know, so you can get a dog that's been through a breeding program, let's say. You might be fortunate enough to get given your dog when it's eight weeks old and then they basically say right you're coming down like i said two days a week for the next year then you go on a course you might my dog was a my spaniel was a failed gun dog so he was 10 months old when he came obviously available for the put for the police to buy they assessed him they they knew he had drive uh, he was relatively obedient and he loved the tennis ball so they can harness that to make him into a police dog so that was mine excuse me some forces go and they'll go to they have a relationship with like Battersea Dog Zone so some people um, 
don't get me wrong, it's not just the current climate, but people will see. Uh, there was a film called about a Malinois in the, the American military called Max, wonderful dog, and he was well known in the military. But then people watch that and then they think, you know what, I'll go and buy myself a Malinois, which is perhaps not uh, the sensiblest of manoeuvres for a civilian, because those dogs, they basically, they need work, they need brain engagement. And, you know, once the puppies savaging the children, you know, savaging the children's pajamas, destroying the furniture, people then go, I can't cope with this. Then it goes off to Battersea or the military or wherever. So yeah, I was I was very lucky. Um both my spaniel and my first patrol dog came from outside breeders. Wow. And I'm guessing the dog lives in kennels then, does it? No, dog comes home with me. So in the ah. police, you you're a dog handler. I missed that off. So when, once you've done your suitability and your pass, you, before you can be allocated a dog, you have a home visit. So one of the sergeants comes round and he inspects your home circumstances is probably the easiest way of saying it. So they'll go and look at your garden. If you've got picket fencing that's 18 inches high, then you're probably not going to get a dog because the dog can just troll off and go and do what it wants. Um, so you like the, the normal standard is sort of six foot fence in secure garden, a place for a compound. So the, my kennel is something like twelve foot, twelve foot from. How can I? It's twelve foot that way, six foot that way, and six foot that way. That's really not very good for listeners, but twelve foot from left to right, six foot from floor to ground, and six foot from front to back, and it's got a sleeping area and the like so you you want to be a dog handler you you have to accept that the dog comes home with you it is without doubt a lifestyle choice not a just not something to do just in work time you know you want you only get out of a dog what you put in so if you want a good police dog then it may very well be that you have to go on a day off and go and lay a track for the dog to keep the dog's brain ticking over um, if you are a person who just seeks to train your dog in works time then don't get me wrong the dog will still be trained to a to a standard but you know the, like I said the more you put into it the more you will get out of it and the dog's job is there is to find suspects find evidence um I suppose everybody really thinks about police dogs chasing and biting people, but that is probably a push 2% of what the dog does in its whole career. Um, you know, you can track for suspects, you search buildings with a patrol dog um, and the search dogs, they go out, they look for drugs, they look for bombs, they look for uh, digital medias and a new, a new thing. One of the guys I work with has done digital media project where dogs go and look for sim cards um you name it so you're looking at sort of um top end crime bits and bobs where people want to keep their dodgy dealings and then they they think they can outsmart a dog but they can't mm. so i'm guessing then neil I'm, I'm guessing a lot of um when an officer gets his dog yeah. and they've gone home, it's, you're going to, if you love your job, you're going to want to try and train it all the time, right? Absolutely. So you, like when you get, if we take patrol dogs, um, so like I said, I used to sort of breed them and allocate them. So you give someone of their potential police dog uh, when it's eight weeks old and then that dog's training starts at eight weeks. You can do things to start a dog on the concept of tracking. So you basically show the officer and the dog, this is what I want you to do. And then you basically give them, for want of a better phrase, some homework. So they have to go and do scent squares for um, in the in in the sort of in the middle of the visit. So you they come and see you on a in January and you you teach them stuff or you look at them, you do the dog's environmental exposure and the like, but you teach them the start of tracking and then you say right for the next four weeks i want you to do that 
twice a week and then they come back you have a look at whether they've done it because you'll know because if the dog walks into the scent square and sort of looks around and goes what's this about then there's a fair clue the handler hasn't done it whereas if the dog goes in and starts whining and watching when it's being laid in front of it if the dog starts if the dog's drive starts to lift um, then you know that the handler's put some work in and then you just progress it in uh, I always get this word wrong I used to I used to say incrementational but then I was told it wasn't a word mm -hmm. uh, I think incremental stages you teach it there's the you know you teach it in steps so you know it's like a it's like a lego plan if you start at page one and you follow the program you'll end up with a lego thing same with dogs if you start at training lesson one and everything goes according to plan to a certain extent uh, take into account the peaks and troughs but you should end up with if it's a police bred dog or a dog that's from an outside breeder that's been tested and the like you should end up with a licensed police dog mm -hmm. what happens then go into the other end of the 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 time the dog's time yep when it starts to get ill maybe or it's not as good as it used to be yep. Do, do you keep hold of it then or is there some sort of so you the dogs work they have a, a sort of sanctioned work in life and um, when the dogs are i think it's six and a half now the handler will reapply for their own job so they have to do another process to be it's called reselection um so they uh, they have to do an application form and they have to do an interview with the chief and he says yay or nay then they'll be given a puppy so for the next 18 months while their operational dog is on the sort of wind down to retirement then they go through the process again but they do it with a young so there's a sort of seamless transition hmm. so when they get given a puppy when the puppy's 15 months old it goes on a basic course which is 12 or 13 weeks and when that dog finishes the previous dog will retire so 95 percent of police will um take their dogs on retirement so the dog will be retired to the handler and then it's um it's the handler's sort of responsibility then if that makes sense um we're quite lucky in london some people did some mega work and set up the london retired police dogs trust so uh, until that was there you didn't really get a massive amount of financial support um, I was quite unfortunate my search dog ended up with cancer in his hips so he had to be I had a very 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 hard decision to make about whether I whether I asked the vet to amputate one of his back legs or whether I put him to sleep and I had that that soul searching thing in my head um, so uh, sadly he got put to sleep because I wasn't, I think dogs would struggle. All their power comes from their, their back end. Yeah. And cool. He'd have ended up, he'd have ended up sort of tripod. So that I had to pay for that. So the sort of x-rays, the assessment, the vet telling me this don't look good. And then you have to pay for him to be sort of put to sleep. Uh, and my first patrol dog, he had cancer in his lungs. So I went to work. He retired early because he had an injury. So he, in one of his jobs, we the pair of us went over a six foot fence to a sort of 15 foot drop, which was unpleasant when you're sort of six foot and 18 stone and it wasn't pleasant for the dog either. So he ended up with a leg injury. So they, uh, they retired him early to the point of where um, I obviously got a new dog or a puppy. Um, but yeah, I, I was at work when my second dog was at work i got a phone call from my missus saying he, he don't look right so we took him to the vet um and he had cancer in his lungs so that was another sort of um not a pleasant time if that makes sense but yeah. uh, these days thanks to uh phil and i can't think of the lady's name what's the lady's name emma Phil and Emma have done a lot of sterling work and there's now a trust that if you have problems with your dog and it's a mega expense, you can speak to them and say, can you give me a hand? And they've got some very good trustees and the like, and they've got some, 
they do a lot of charity work so there's a there's a facility in place now where you, it doesn't sort of or it can if they if it meets the criteria then the handlers can get a little bit of help for the dog if that makes sense because the dog the dog will have worked for eight years of its life and then it becomes the handler's responsibility which again is an unwritten rule if you know what i mean um but it's it's good that they've got that charity off the ground at the end of the day because you know veterinary bills can be seriously expensive for some just to find out that you could you're gonna have to sort of put your dog to sleep yeah it i think a lot of people will be surprised at that neil that you have to pay for it yourself is that what's the philosophy behind that um that, that i don't know it's, it's always been it's always been the way um you want to be a dog handler like i said it's a lifestyle choice um don't get me wrong i'm far from being critical i took my i took both my dogs on and i knew I knew the ramifications and I went into it eyes open fully and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had it any, any other way. Those dogs were mine. You know, I brought them up. Um, they worked for me. My, couple, you know, my patrol dog got me out of a couple of sticky situations. So I owed the dog some loyalty at the end of the day. Um, so, and these charities are becoming more and more the norm. Um, it took, the two guys at the in London a long time to get it off the ground. We were talking about it with a guy, uh, Bish, that I used to work with. We were talking about, or it was up in conversation, you know, ten years ago. And I think it takes a lot of time, effort, and work to get it off the ground. But it's becoming more prevalent. A lot of the county forces have them now. So, and it's an important thing for the dogs to get some semblance of support because they do work. They do work very hard for what they do to the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Do you ever think, um, I, I worked in a salmon factory, right, up in Norway. I, I chopped salmon for nine months and there's bits right. of salmon going everywhere. The skin, the bones is all, you know, off, yeah. to, off to one side. Well, obviously all that gets sold to, at the minimum, I'm going to say like fish food companies, right? Yeah a lot of it probably gets recycled and fed back to the salmon it's not yep. a pretty it's not a pretty industry <laughs> but you've got all these um factory farmed animals whether they're salmon or cows or, or or lamb or whatever it might be and of course they're full of chemicals and steroids and antibiotics yeah. and then all this um waste from the you know human food chain is then put into pet food, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess, right? right? So a lifetime of an animal eating that kind of food, it's not surprising that they get... Um... Don't get me wrong. I mean, the dogs get very well looked after. They get all their veterinary bills are squared away. They get inoculated. They get the very, very, very best of care mm. um, to the point where... You know, like that. Yeah, they are exceptionally well looked after. The food they get, there's a the forces. I'm sure have like London does. You you have a contract for a food manufacturer, and it goes through a process of assessment, and they do get exceptionally well looked after. You know, it's not it's not done on a uh, on a thread budget, if that makes sense. It's that they do get a phenomenal amount of care mm. we get a bit at the end and you know quite rightly so that they 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 work hard you know there's police dogs out i'm sure all over the uk they're certainly doing it in london where they're doing their doing their job they're protecting people they're stopping people from thieving from people's houses they're dealing with the myriad of options of crime and it does go um People inside the job know about it, but the public necess don't necessarily. Um, but you know, there's there's a lot of dogs and a lot of handlers doing exceptional work for for the service and for their yeah for the public basically. Mm, yeah, got you. And when you're putting your your puppy, so to speak, in with the older dog, yeah. is I'm guessing the puppy's learning skills from the yeah. So. You sort of bring your, you have your old dog at home, you go and get your new one. The probably the best method of the introduction is somewhere outside, outside of 
the house outside of the garden. The garden for, per se is uh, the older dog's domain. So rather than bowl in there with a complete stranger and say, well, yeah, here's your new mate, deal with that. At times that can go bandy. Um, so you sort of take them, you know, a public park maybe. Both dogs on the lead. The pup don't know that it's new and it don't know what the old dog is. So the pup will be sociable. You just have to watch that the old dog doesn't react adversely and give it, once the introduction's done, as long as there's no adverse behavior from the older dog, then you sort of transition them living into the kennel outside and then they become best mates at the end of the day. The pup will bother the older dog um, because the pup does, because it's young and daft and doesn't know. And the young, the older dogs tend to be, uh, they tend to be very tolerant of the youngster. And then uh, like my, I did uh, my, my retiring patrol dog, GP dog. He then came to live inside when he retired because, you know, he had an injury and I wanted him to be warm and sort of where I could keep an eye on him at night time and the like. So he became uh, a sofa dog. Um, and then the the young whippersnapper lived outside and that was then his residence, if that makes sense. Mm. Do, do any officers or, or anyone for that matter go private with this sort of enterprise? When with they, regards to what? Well, when you've learned how to train a dog, you, you, know, you know how to handle it. Um, there is, like, is um, there like a commodity in Civvy Street that... Yeah, people... you can... The police have exceptionally high standards for their dogs um, and that in turn can transition to the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, some people that sort of they retire from being a dog handler or like, I mean, I'm currently a dog instructor, so I could retire. I have qualifications that say I'm a police dog instructor and they are quite well thought of in the private sector, if that makes sense. So then you can go you know like you could work in a for a security company security companies have dog sections don't they mm -hmm. so you could work as the trainer instructor in that some people retire as a police officer and they have roles where they come back as a civilian or a member of police staff so they retire friday uh, mr smith or sorry pc smith mm -hmm. and then they'll come back in after a little bit of time off and they'll be mr smith but they carry on because their qualifications don't lapse as long as you keep uh as long as you keep training dogs in the area that you're capable of instructing in then your sort of qualification will remain current does that make sense so if you yeah. do your instructor's course and then you're in you're a police dog instructor you're sort of authorized by i think it was acpo but it's now the, like the national police chiefs council so you get a ticket that says you've been assessed you can train police dogs and then that has to you have to keep your you have to uh, you have to keep your feet in the paddling pool in order to keep your ticket valid yeah i was wondering if there's any kind of demand a silly example you know my wife's lost her wedding ring on the beach could could the dog so i personally i've done that once uh, i was out walking my first dog and uh, i could see a woman up ahead who I think she lived like three, four doors down and she's obviously looking for something. Mm. So I was like, well, okay. And I had the dog with me. So I said, right, what's the problem? She said, oh, I've lost my house keys. I was like, right, okay. Mm -hmm. So you go, it then turns into, you turn into a policeman then. Where did you, you know, are you sure you've got them? Where, what route have you taken is the critical point. Mm. Um, so then I basically said, right, you know, where did you stop running? So she points, she's obviously started to backtrack, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I've sort of said, look, go home, um, give me 20 minutes. So I've gone back, I've started where she identified and I've worked the route backwards and I found it, I mean, the dog found her house keys. And that, you know, don't get me wrong, awesome for her because she didn't have to wait for her, her other half to come home and let her in, you know, they didn't have to change the locks. But for me, it's like live training. There's a bit yeah. of property out for my dog of a scent that he's not used to. So you get a little bit of live training in your own time, if that makes sense. Mm. That's a great little story. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so can we talk about some incidents then as your career progressed, your kind of fines and your and your successes? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was quite lucky. So I obviously I worked the East End of London. I was on a team of fantastic people. They looked after me. They taught me the skill of being a police officer, if that makes sense. Um, and then courses become available in the police. So um, you don't just, being a relief officer is is the core of policing, but you can do other things. You can be a public order officer. So like, you know, like they, what, what, what do the public call them? Sort of like the riot squad, shall we say, the big helmet, the shield, that's the absolute like full tilt, something's gone wrong. I've got to put all this kit on and there's going to be, there's problems somewhere. So you can do a course to do that. There's a there's a search officers course where the military or a, a combined military police training team teach you um, sort of like proper pucker top tier searching of premises. So I'm talking fingertip searching, starting at the doorway, working around the room in a clockwise fashion, looking for hides and the like. It's all stems from, sort of organisational learning from Ulster. So I was quite fortunate, I did that. Um, one of my best finds was we were doing a, an inquiry, doing a search of a, of, a, of a flat. And I'll never forget, I'll forget it. I, I was talking about it the other day. I remember it like it was yesterday. There's, um, it's a small flat. And in the back of a wardrobe, there's a wood panel. And, and for some reason, something's telling me I want to have a look behind that wood panel. I don't know what it was, but if you're going to search somewhere, you should search it properly. So the guy I was with sort of looked at me. I was the youngster and he's like, well, if you want to take it off, take it off. And he'd sort of a bit of eye roll and a bit of you're wasting your time. So we take the wood panel off and behind it, we found a receipt to a pawn shop for the victim's electric guitar. Mm. And it was the only thing that pinned the suspect to the offence he'd committed. Wow. And I'll never forget the superintendent for the inquiry came in and he almost skipped through the door because I think they'd potentially sort of got to a point where they knew who was in play, but I don't know whether they could entirely prove it, if that makes sense. So that's, yeah, that's that's a good one. That's a proper, a proper sort of a critical bit of evidence for an inquiry, if that makes sense from yeah. a relief police officer's point of view. How was it then at, at, at the airports? Um, you, you often see an officer with a dog. Yeah. For example, I mean, in New Zealand, they're very hot on bringing foreign food into their yep. country for the sort of germ control and that yep. sort of stuff. So um, we used to deploy search dogs, so dogs that find explosives, because that's one of the things that, happens if that makes a terrorist trend to an extent isn't it um so you do for the police in london you have certain jobs to do um you know we used to have to do specific searches to make sure certain parts of the airport were safe not only for the staff but for the public um then if uh, when there's a uh, what's it called when you go as a passenger, there's a search regime, isn't there? So if you if your luggage goes through one of the scannery things and it flags up or something, then obviously the balloon goes up. There's systems in place where the dogs will turn up. You might get asked, run your dog over that bag, tell us what's in it, um, or you know, tell us if your dog's found anything in it. And then the um, EOD would go down and do their thing. Um, you do VCPs, so you do car. Uh, they set up a vehicle checkpoint. They identify cars that they're in, that they're interested in. Be it, you know, these and these number plate readery things. They'll flag up cars that are of interest, shall we say? Mm -hmm. So they might get pulled in. You do a search around that. Um, and don't get me wrong, you're not just talking like I did uh, explosive search my dog. You might you'd have a drugs dog and a firearms recovery dog there as well. So you're uh, it's a multifaceted search to um, basically put off people that want to do harm to people. They they put it. They try to put them off. For, it's a visible, visible presence that people sort of look, and when they start to think about doing things that they shouldn't, then 
they sort of turn up and they go, all right, they are here, they are looking, they are watching. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I learned on my search course was the age old thing. I think, I think the IRA said it many moons ago where they said um, the police and the military have got to be on point every time. We've only got to be fortunate once to sort of commit an atrocity, if that makes sense, which that, that boat don't float. So you've got to do your, the police have got to do their thing, do their very best to make sure these sort of things don't, or they've got to try their best to make sure they don't get to do what they want to. Mm. Have you got any other examples then, Neil, of um, finding substances or? So the best bit for a cert, for a bomb dog handler, you don't really want to find something. So that's the that's that. Um, you, you know, I I did some good searches. I've been fortunate enough to be on the inside of um, Buckingham Palace. You go and do parts of Parliament on a daily basis. Um, you know, when I was a GP handler, you go, you turn up. It's your job there. You're there. The police obviously have done their bit. They might chase someone. They've done whatever. Um, I did one where they were, we got sent out to Bedfordshire. So a lady had disappeared. So we did a victim recovery search. Um, and we had, she'd been seen on, uh, she'd been seen somewhere on CCTV and between that and the next point where she'd been picked up or she hadn't been picked up do you know what I mean it, she'd obviously disappeared somewhere so we get given a load of search parameters and we were in a park and I was walking back so we had a sort of staging area so I was walking back to this area my dog was loose i had good control of my dog so he was loose just trolling around and then all of a sudden he goes off and on the middle of a, um, a pavement going through a park he starts searching i watch his tail so his tail starts to go which is again about reading the dog i start to think oh what's going on over there and then he indicates so this is a loose search he's not been tasked to do anything really so it goes to show he was he was all right. He was re he was pretty good at what he did. So I go up and I have a look and there's six or seven spots of blood on the ground, dried blood. Now I grant you, it wasn't linked to the offence that we were dealing with, if that makes sense. However, it goes to show the level of capability in a dog. We were in a probably a 30 acre park, if you know what I mean, just walking back to go for a cup of tea because he'd already been working for an hour and a half. Um, and then he goes off and he indicates full blown on five or six spots of blood on the floor. Mm. So yeah, I mean, and then, I mean, there's probably quite a few. Um, I remember I did one where there was a, I think it was an aggravated burglary and I ended up probably doing 40 or 50 back gardens, ending up going different directions. You know, somebody would sort of pop up, are you looking for someone? Uh, yeah, and then they'd sort of point you might want to go that way and it, it turns out i think it took me about an hour and a half but in turn we turned up um the the actual suspect from the offense so he'd obviously thought he'd discarded property it was a bit like the um hansel and gretel the trail of breadcrumbs we start at one point four or five fences find a broken fence member of the public goes oh you might want to go down there do a few more and then we find a jumper which is obviously his and then, you know, you go a few more, then you go around a corner and then you sort of see him sort of meandering down the road, looking all nonchalant and not guilty. And then, so yeah, that was, that's a good one. There's lots to be honest, Chris. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate. My dogs were, were pretty good. I mean, my first patrol dog did, he did firearms recovery as well. So I remember doing a premises search in somewhere, like somewhere in the East end of London. And it was for a, a young a real youngster and he'd been given something to look after by sort of older people who were sort of trying to cajole him into the wrong ways of life and the dog gave a full-blown indication i'm sort of looking at and going are you actually sure because he's on over um like wood flooring so i said to the detectives just have a look under there he's he's telling me there's something under there so we go under there white cloth and there's two handguns under the, there's two handguns hidden under his bedroom floor. Wow. Um, yeah, there's lots, to be honest. I've had good operational tracks to suspects. You know, the proverbial 
decamp. You know, the bloke, the police chase them. One bloke runs off. So the police routinely, they'll chase them, but then they get to the, you know, people, uh, people that want to get away from the police sort of most of the time do. So I remember it was Wormwood Scrubs, it was where the prison literally 15 foot from the wall of the prison, this inspector was obviously hanging out because he'd had to run after the, after the geezer and he'd stopped. And he said, I haven't been down there. He's gone down there. So I was obviously tracking harness on and the suspect maybe wasn't the cleverest individual I've ever encountered. So we went basically 75 yards, the first clump of trees, and I'm talking probably eight trees. We're going down the pavement in a straight line. The dog goes, we're going this way, into the clump of trees, woof, 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 woof. So there was the second suspect. They're quite rare. You don't really get a lot of, not in London, you don't get a lot of tracks to suspects. And um, people normally, you know, it's a residential street. People run away from the police if they don't try and hunker down and hide somewhere, hoping that the dogs don't, or the dogs or the helicopter don't turn up. Um, you know, they mm. sometimes will get away unless the police are very fortunate. Um, I had one where I don't wish to be dis dis um, disparaging to my colleagues in the air support unit, but they they cleared an area, told the local police that there was nobody there. And my dog found the geezer in about 30 seconds. Um, he was very, very well hidden. So that, you know, the helicopters up circling, they've got thermal imaging and stuff. But if it's deep, 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 thick undergrowth, then that's where you have to do interdepartmental working. They might say, yeah, it's clear from our point of view, but if it's deep, brambles and the like then the thermal imaging won't get through it so I was fortunate enough that I think I think he was wanted for some sort of sexual offence and he was well hidden literally lying up against a fence panel with probably eight nine foot of brambles on top of him but that just to the dog that smells like well there's a geezer under there with a load of brambles on his head so it doesn't really bother the dog so um yeah so that that's another one um There's lots, Chris, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> There's bet. lots. I bet. What's it like then if, if you've got a dog that's trained to sniff out substances yeah. and you're walking down the street of it and someone goes by and they've just smoked a joint? Or, or, um, is that, does well, that ever? So for a, a normal normal search dog, that, that would probably not be a, a massive issue. At the bottom, um, so dogs that are passive scanning dogs, so if you've been in contact or you've smoked or you've got gear on you, the dog will, they sort of drift past you, they'll scan, they know, and then they follow you and then they sit, and you've seen it, probably seen them on the TV, they sit in front of you and the police come and go, right, the dog's telling me you've got gear on you, have you got it? Um, yeah, I mean, the dogs will probably show you levels of interest and then the officers have got a decision to make. Do they want to intervene perhaps in their own perhaps where they live, if that makes sense. You've got, you know, um, yeah. I mean, the dogs will show interest, if that makes sense. Um, I had one a long time ago where I could obviously hear uh, a scrambler bike hooning around in a park and nine, nine times out of 10, they probably don't belong to the person that rides them. Hmm. So we come barreling around the corner I've seen no it no plates. There's two two geezers on it, and you can see the ignition barrel hanging out of it. So that's stone cold stolen. And then he bimbles off. I'm sort of carrying on walking my dog, minding my own business. Um, and then you hear a load of shouting, and then the two of them come hot footing it round the corner without the bike. And I look through them, and you see a PC in a reflective gel text jacket chasing them. So they're sort of running towards me. So they've obviously done something wrong. You know, it was, it wasn't, it was near where I live. So I did a gentle challenge. I said, look, fellas, police officer dog, stop, you know, cause they're basically, they're in, they're in commission of an offense, aren't they? So, um, so then they sort of thought, oh, okay. Wrong place, wrong time for them. Right place, right time for me. 
Uh, so that stopped them from getting away from the police. Um, but that, you know, you have, you know, the dogs are very good, but it's, it's also good to try and find somewhere to walk the dog where you maybe don't routinely um, run into people, if that makes sense. You know, the dog at the end of the day is a is a police dog and it it has got a job in life, but it's nice to go somewhere where perhaps runners aren't going to come barreling around the corner flat out because the dog, if the dog's off the lead, you don't want the dog chasing you doing your 200 miles if you catch my drift. So you have to you have to be sensible and um, you know go and walk somewhere where there's a fair chance you might not come into contact with a lot of people because the dog needs time off. Yeah, don't don't walk it down Electric Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never get anywhere if you live there. <laughs> yeah, I mean you know it is the dog. The dog goes to work, it works for eight hours in and out of the back of the van doing varying different things. And then they're, they're like me, I need to go home to relax and have a have a sleep before I go back and do it again, or when I used to do it. And the dog's the same. They go in the compound. If they've had a busy day at work, you won't see them for three or four hours because they go in, literally curl up, and they're like that. Right, I'll see you later. We'll have a walk about 7 p.m. But other than that, don't disturb me. So they do need they do need time off to sort of unwind and just be a dog basically sniff leaves do stuff they shouldn't and just generally just be a dog and neil we were going to talk about um you mentioned the africa poaching connection oh yeah so i've got um a couple of friends of mine are involved in a thing called um i'm gonna to have to look it up again that's not very good for a recording i do apologize oh that's okay Dogs for Wildlife. So it's um it's a dog initiative whereby people in this country help with the training and supply of some dogs that work on the animal conservation parks. Um it's run by a, a, a good friend of mine and or a couple of good friends of mine. So it's just something that people should if there there's any scope, um just have a look at it. Dogs for wildlife, it's called, and they're obviously doing a lot of good work for uh, anti-poaching in Africa whereby obviously some of these magnificent animals in Africa are on the verge of extinction and so they do a lot of good stuff with regards to trying to stop the poachers and the like um yeah and that's about it really sorry that's not the world's best plug in the world no I'm, I'm just thinking I think the poachers use dogs as well don't they I, I don't admit, as far as I know, I think the, the, the whole anti-poaching element is um, it's sort of the same as it's not a police dog, but it's the same. It'll track. They'll get to a point where they identify some poachers might be cutting about. So they'll then put the dog out to track. The dog will potentially get them to the point of where the, the poachers are. I think the dogs are trained to defend the, the park rangers because they do get in, I think they get in a few bumps with the poachers whereby there's a bit of gunfire and the like, because they're quite keen not to get caught. So yeah, I mean, it's basically the same sort of thing that I'm used to knocking around doing, but it's another sort of element of how how good dogs can be and the different roles, I suppose, on, on the planet that they can have and yeah, I think it's just an important thing to try and look after some of these animals. They're only they're only drifting around in their own habitat, and then somebody turns up and tries to see them off because they've got something that's valuable to somebody else. If that makes sense, it's not, you know, it's. And I think it would be nice to try and get some of these some of these rarer animals back to where they should be at the end of the day. Yeah, definitely. I I heard something the other day that. They used to chop the horns off the rhinos, didn't they, with a chainsaw, yeah, they, right? Well, so the, the a lot of the for some of the rarer animals, I think the park rangers now dehorn the animals, so mm. they'll go out and knock it out, and they take the they take the valuable element is the horn, so they take the horn off of the rhino, so that the poachers will go, it's worthless, and they'll potentially or ideally leave it be. Mm. But again, that's that's a bit harsh for the rhino if you catch my drift. Um, well, what I heard, Neil, is now the poachers will kill it anyway because... Again, I did have that thought. I think they do because they then don't want to be 
What did they, what did the telly say? They don't animal. want to waste their day. You're right, you're spot on. They don't want to waste the day tracking an animal that's worthless to them, which is bonkers. You know, they should just, well, you know, me personally, I'm an animal lover, just leave it be. But I don't think that's, I don't think it's going away anytime soon if you catch my drift. So if the, you know, if the lads for the dogs for wildlife, and don't get me wrong, they're not the only one, but, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of support if there is, um, to try and sort of alleviate some of the issues that they're that they're working towards. Just a, uh, another silly question, but let's just say back in my uh, party days, <laughs> I I knew a guy, and um, asking for a friend, yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it it was actually my my. <laughs> okay. What I'm saying is, not not talking about me here. This was actually <laughs> a friend of mine, but. He used to sell uh, certain party prescriptions, yeah. And he always had a a pot of pepper on his stairs. Okay, and if absolutely you him, worthless. If you said to him, "What's the pepper for?" It's like he'd say to fuck up the sniffer. No, no, but... absolutely worthless. It's uh, the dog's noses are that clever that it basically smells like well, that's pepper, but underneath it's ten grams of cocaine. Wow. Yes, because that's, how, that's how good stuff. they are. People hide stuff in coffee, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. If right. the scent's available, the dog will find it. Yeah. So, I won't be doing that anymore then. No, you need to get rid of your coffee stash. Yeah. <laughs> I, I better call Columbia and tell him we'd change the plan. <laughs> yeah, call your friends in Bogota and tell them to wind it in a bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what's... Do you have any view of this... Um, like giving medals to dogs, like that's become a thing now, hasn't it? And, and... Well, so the, uh, the Dickin medal is the animal Victoria Cross. That's been knocking around for a long time. I think um, the, uh, the dog that's been in the press recently, the, the Shakey's dog, uh, what's his name? Kuno. I think he's the 72nd recipient, I believe. Oh. Uh, well deserved genuinely 100 percent well deserved i mean that's a that's a proper proper dog that proper proper frog dog um there's a few guys that i work with that have got the dickin medal um so the terrorist attacks in london bridge obviously the search dogs turned up they did a load of good work with the initial aftermath of that so they were recognized for their work for they got they are they've got the dickin medals in actually i think the actual medals given to the dog so the handler doesn't get it it's actually given to the animal mm. so we've got at work we've got three or four on a on on a wall in in our dog school so that's the most recent one uh, a guy i used to work with he got the dickin medal for the 7th of july attack he went on he searched the bus at Tavistock Square and he went down and I believe he was one of the first people onto the tube so he cleared the tube uh, again very very well deserved that is without doubt for a search handler that is the absolute that's sort of um you said earlier like when you get your rifle as a boot neck at Limston you want to sort of go off and you're like right now I actually want to go off and be a soldier mm -hmm. so for a dog handler he he did that, turned up at a call, terrorist incident, ongoing, the like. He searched. He made it clear for the first responders, right, you can now go and do your job, go and try and, you know, save people, treat people. Um, I do think they're, the dogs need to be recognised for what they do, 100%. Uh, like Kuno, yeah, I mean, he saved he saved a lot of lads that day, 100%. So he deserves it. Um he also, I mean, he looks quite Gucci in his little prosthetic legs, I have to say. Um, yeah, I've you know, seen that. Custom built prosthetic legs because you've got their, um, I guess, whoever the MOD have basically said, yeah, look after him because he's done something right. Do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. again, he's got, he's getting, uh, he's got that so that he doesn't have to not be about. So, you know, and then. You know, that, I mean, a guy I used to work with, his dog had a, his dog had a, had a medical problem in a, in the dog's back end, 
So a guy that makes, um, they make the little sort of like the wheeled contraptions that you strap the dog in. Yeah. So he was, the guy, I mean, uh, the guy's a friend of mine. He was quite fortunate. The company that make them donated the contraption so that his dog's back end got strapped in it. A front end still, front leg still works. So she was still able to stay, stay about and go for a walk, albeit slower. And the, the company were very good. They, they made a sort of charitable donation to him and the dog so that the dog didn't have to be put to sleep because her quality of life went down. But with that contraption, um, she was able to have another year, 18 months. So, yeah, fair play. But, yeah, I mean, go, sorry, I'm waffling a bit. Going back to the medals, I think the dogs need some form of recognition. Um, it obviously goes through a process where people look at it and they go, yes, we'll award it. Um, and, but it's not... I don't think they're thrown around willy-nilly if you catch my drift. So, you know, 99% to 100% of the time, the dogs will have done something pretty special in order to be even considered for it. Yeah, got you. It makes me chuckle thinking of come Remembrance Day, dog dog puts his bed alarm and goes down the pub. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, goes down, goes down the pub for a pint of stouts in a bowl. <laughs> So Neil, are you at liberty to say what 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 does your career hold? What you what you up to now? Um, I still I so I'm a permanent dog training instructor. Um, what year are we in? Two thousand and twenty-one. Five and a half odd years ago, I was approached by um, the dog training establishment. They wanted they wanted me to consider applying for a job that was coming up. So I now train dogs permanently. Um, at the minute. I work on a confidential project teaching some dogs to do some Gucci stuff for some Gucci blokes. Um, so that's what it holds. Um, I've got 20, 23 years service. So I've still got some time to do. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate to do what I do. I get to train dogs and um, I'm fortunate that, you know some of the handlers keep in touch so if i train a dog the handlers occasionally keep in touch and they'll go oh by the way you know x had a magnificent find the other night they they had a really good they turfed a suspect out that they thought was long gone so i'm i'm quite fortunate that i get to have a very small say in you know in police dogs really and you know that's that's what i that's what i sort of do it for um, you, like you know the occasional text message at three o'clock in the morning saying oh I've just had this mega job and I've done x is is that's that's good enough for me mm -hmm. brilliant well Neil thanks ever so much for coming to chat to us no, thank you for God. your service to this country on behalf I, of the listen there's a lot more people on the face of God's green earth that have done a lot more for the country than I have and I'm 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 quite fortunate that I've got a good job where I get to do what I like and I wouldn't give it up for the world. Mm. But I mean, genuinely, Chris, thanks very much for letting me come on. Um, you can try and edit it and not make me look too much of a tool. That'd be good. Mate, you've been perfect. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely perfect. It's, um, um, and uh, fair play to you for your 200 mile yomp. That's what cars are for, mate. Genuinely, 100%. That's what cars are for. Yes, I, I, I am going to factor that in next time. <laughs> don't invite me because I'd get 20 yards and I'd be like, no, this is not working, Chris. We're not doing this. Yeah, it did all end up a bit random, I will. But, uh, <laughs> Good effort. Conversation. But um, yes, thank you ever, ever so much. If people um, wanted to get hold of you for any kind of like consultation, um, it, Oh mate, I'm not. Don't get me wrong. I, I wouldn't. I don't really do that sort of thing. Um, I do breed dogs, so I breed Malinois and Dutch herders outside of work. So I'm. I've sort of got a little registered business interest where me and a guy, who's like, he's like my brother from another mother. Bless him, uh, little JK. He's he's a mega bloke. He's he is like he's a diamond. I've got all the time in the world for him. Me and him did a couple of dogs for you know we trapped we bred some litters that went into service with the military and the police um but that sort of occupies my free time i'm on twitter i think i'm on twitter with at roscoe the dog but obviously it's sort of a private thing not really um 
job related and I'm on that you pick me up on that LinkedIn thing yeah I only mentioned Neil because I mean for any reason there might be someone that goes did I want I need to ask this guy a question or I need need I mean that that LinkedIn thing I think and Twitter I'm on Instagram let me see what the thing on Instagram is sorry I'm doing it again where we're in the middle of a recording oh it's fine all right my my Instagram is uh, Von Rader, V O N R A I D E R, uh, and that's uh, that's sort of my dog kennel name for my dog breeding, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm on Instagram. I don't really post a lot. I use it more for seeing what's going on. And um, in fact, I've only uh, that's not very good. I've got 16 posts on there, which is not brilliant. Mainly of dogs biting people and the like. Um, but you know that probably the LinkedIn is the thing to get hold of me if people have a massive yearn to talk to me if anything makes sense yes brilliant well thank you again mate just stay on the line so I can thank you properly okay bud no problem and to, to speak to you yes it's been great thank you Good effort. like I say I get to chat about the stuff that I want to in life hey, mate, I mean pod- podcasts are the way forward like if you just said to me 18 months ago I'd be talking to you I've never even met you but you know I feel like we've actually got a connection because we've sat and had a chit chat on a Friday so yeah Yeah. mega thanks very much for letting me come on oh you're more than welcome and to everybody at home if you could please like and subscribe so we can do more of this great content much love to you all look after yourselves